Kenny, the Reds went three and two since we last spoke. They're now 40 and 45, fourth in the NL Central, 10 games back of the first place Brewers, and four and a half games back of the third wild card spot in the National League. Let's start with this. Jonathan India had an insane month of June. That's what a lot of people have been talking about over the last few days. He's now first on the Reds in batting average, 278, on base percentage at 381, second on the team in hits and doubles. His 13 doubles in June were the most by Reds player in a calendar month since Joey Votto in September of 2009. So with all that being said, where do you think Jonathan India fits in the Reds' future plans? There was a ton of talk about him being traded last year or in the offseason, and I think it's come up a, a little bit again this year even when he struggled early. Where are you at now with Jonathan India, and more importantly, where should the Reds be at with him? Um, I, I think they should dangle him at this trade deadline, to be honest with you, um, because I, 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 there's no question they need outfield bats desperately. I mean, the outfield bats, if you take St Spencer Steers st starts in the outfield out of the mix, the, the outfield bats are horrific. The slash lines are just anemic. So you need that help long term. You have what you would hope and expect to be a long term solution at second base, right? And that would be uh, Matt McClain. You, you may have to piecemeal it this year because Matt McClain probably isn't going to be back, but he's your long term second baseman. So, with that in mind, at that point, where does Jonathan India fit on the roster? He probably doesn't. Um, and again, I, you know, there was some some hand wringing when they extended him back in, in the in the off season of what, what are you doing? You well, it ended up working out because they wind up needing Jonathan India, but. If he's going to get you a long-term solution in the outfield, if he's part of a package that gets you a guy that's not just here for the rest of this year as an outfielder, but, but moving forward for maybe another couple of controllable years, however it would work out, um, I, I think you have to dangle him. Um, I, I will say, I mean, to his credit, he certainly played. He is he has helped their cause as much as anything else, both, both in the short term and maybe with what they could get for him if they dangle him. Yeah, I guess you know, there's fans like to flip so quickly on these things like if a guy's going bad it's he's the worst ever send him a triple a trade him get rid of him then as soon as he starts doing well it's like why would you consider trading him he's just playing well he's he's a cornerstone for us and it's like i mean neither is true obviously the answer right. is somewhere in the middle on jonathan india the question is i guess do you think there is some long-term value like he was rookie of the year he had basically two down years in a row that weren't very impressive and started this year off slow and now all of a sudden he's starting to show some of the same type of fire at the plate that he had his rookie year. And it's like, oh, this is maybe the upward trajectory people had expected for him two years ago after that first season when he was so impressive. I, I guess, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like there's still upside that he can be a star player in the National League? No, I think he can be a very solid player, which he's shown at the moment. I mean, he's, he obviously had a special month, no doubt about that. Um, but I think he's always he was always going to be a solid player. The thing is, long term, where does he play? Where does he fit right. in? He doesn't. That, I think that's the thing. Um, I, I guess, you know, you dangle him at the trade deadline. If you don't get the offer you're looking for, it's not the end of the world to keep him because he will finish out the year likely as the starting second baseman. And I guess it gives you insurance that let's, you know, I, I can't assume or presume that Matt McClain comes back 100%. Matt McClain comes back at all. Um, I'm hoping that. We're all hoping that. If it's the Matt McClain we saw last year, that's your future second baseman. So, you know, he is also an insurance policy in that regard, but He's not a cornerstone. You know, he's a man without an island. I mean, he's playing second base by default at the moment. Um, you know, he's never going to be a great defensive second baseman, for goodness sakes. We made that mistake with multiple guys after last season, though. Seeing a, a glimpse of them last year and say, projecting out what they're going to be for the future in the Reds. And this year, that hasn't proven true for some of those guys. Is it possible that, like, McLean or Marte or, or one of these younger infielders that were putting in and permanent marker saying they're the, the second baseman or third baseman of the future. Is it possible that maybe we're too high on, on one of those guys? Um, sure. Uh, because they haven't proven it for long periods of time, but that's the calculation you have to make here is, you know, what you saw from Matt McClain suggests he is going to be a long time successful player in this league. If he stays healthy, no, they Marte, maybe the jury's out a little bit because the smaller sample size, but you know, he was always considered a top prospect came up and proved it in a short period of time. And, um, you know, obviously was struggling at Louisville and, after that first game in, in St. Louis has kind of struggled since, but that's such a small sample size. You can't make a judgment on that. So uh, again, if you flip Jonathan, any of the trade deadline, I wouldn't go crazy. I would, I would hope again, it's for something of long-term solution as an for an outfielder, but if you hang on to him, I'm okay with that for the short period of time, maybe dangle him then again in the off season. And um, you have more information at that point on Matt McClain's health. I, I think that's, that's also has to factor in again. I, I would expect Matt McClain comes back, but you know, this feels like this thing's going on and on and on and on and on. And 
you know, maybe it was a pipe dream to think he'd come back at any point this year. And maybe the best thing is he doesn't play it all this year, but uh, yeah, either way I'm, I'm good with it. I, I just don't, I don't consider Jonathan India a cornerstone. Do I consider him a starting player? I do just not on this team. If Matt McClain's healthy. Do you, th- how much value do you think there is as a, a trade bait piece? Do you think they can well, get some type of return for him or at least package him with something else for yeah, a decent return? It would still have to include a, a prospect. I mean, it would have to include, a top prospect in my opinion, maybe not Cam Collier, certainly not Rhett Louder. Um, you know, I would hope not Chase Petty, but maybe him. I some somebody else would have to be packaged in that deal because somebody's gonna want more controllable assets than than Jonathan India, um, who's you know closer to arbit is, is actually into arbitration and, and closer to to free agency. So um yeah, I I you would have to package him with something. It wouldn't just be a straight up deal in my opinion. As we're talking about how well India has been playing, and all of a sudden he's risen to the top of the red statistical leaderboards in a lot of different categories, we're also approaching the All-Star game. And talks about who is going to be the Reds All-Star this year have been percolating. I know a lot of people are on the Ellie De La Cruz part of the conversation and kind of stuck there of like, well, we think it's going to be Ellie, but if it's not, then we'll just talk about that later. Where are you at on this? Because it, it also feels like there are a couple of guys ahead of Ellie at the shortstop position right now. Well, I will tell you this. Ellie leads all shortstops and runs scored, home runs. Um, I believe he's second or third in war. He leads all shortstops in OPS. He clearly leads all shortstops because he leads all of Major League Baseball in stolen bases. Um, that is an all-star season for me. Now, the problem is Colorado has to have a representative, and their best position player by far is shortstop Ezekiel Tovar. They do have a closer that that they could maybe get as a as a on the on the all-star team as a as a player. Um, and uh, the same thing for um I, I can't remember it was Washington, maybe or was it second base? The way I looked at it was, was believe it or not, Ellie has probably a harder path to make it than Jonathan India does positionally. At the same time, though, to me, I think I'm taking Ellie over Ezekiel Tovar and letting Colorado get a pitcher on the staff and, and be done with that. And um, I, I think at that point, Ellie is going to be the all-star. I, to me, it's between three guys. It's India, um, Ellie, and Fernando Cruz. And I just don't think that that's going to take place. I, I think it's going to be Ellie for every reason you can imagine. A, like I said, just go by the positional ranks for him. Um, you know, the fact that Mookie Betts is obviously out doesn't doesn't hurt, but he would they would end up taking three shortstops. Ellie would probably be the third of the three, maybe the second three, whatever. But he, I, I think they take three shortstops, and I do think Ellie's the guy that is the Reds representative, despite Jonathan India really coming on and actually in his position group being among the leaders in a bunch of bunch of different stats. Do you think there's any potential for one of the starting pitchers to to make it or I, no? I don't. Um I, yeah, I mean, I, you could make a case for Hunter Green. Believe it or not, Hunter Green in war is either second or third, I think. I looked at this a couple of days ago. He's up there, certainly, um, among all pitchers, among all qualifying pitchers. Cruz leads the majors in strikeouts per innings pitched. And if you take a couple of his outings out of there, the ERA doesn't pop at you. But if you take a couple of his stints out of the, the mix, you know, and 30 of his 33 appearances, he's been lights out for the most part or whatever it would be. Um, I think he's a possibility but there's so many pitchers to choose from. And like I said, you go around and look at some of the teams that are all going to get one guy. Uh, it's probably for most of those teams going to be a pitcher. One of the other topics that have come with the all-star game and the Reds and Ellie is the home run derby. He is not going to participate in this Yay. year's home run derby. Do you like that decision by Ellie yeah, De La Cruz? I do. I, I, I have no empirical proof that it ruins guys. I don't. I'm. I'm not going to do some deep dive analytic study on it. I just. It, it, I just don't need him screwing up his swing at this point. He feels like he's got himself in a nice groove on both from both sides of the plate at the moment. You know, remember for a while he had a really hard time hitting right handed against lefties as a switch hitter, and it feels like I mean he hit a home run. The home run he hit last uh, on Tuesday night was was as a right handed batter. It was a missile. Um. So yeah, I just no. I. I, I the other part too, honestly, is. Um. I do think he's the representative, so he's not going to get much of a break. I'd hate to add another layer to it with the home run derby for a guy who, because you've had to do it almost by default, hasn't gotten, but I think one day off, and that one day off, he actually came in and played late. So he's played in every game and started all but one this year. I mean, the guy could probably use a little bit of a break and, you know, sitting around on the bench and getting a, and a bat in the All-Star game is not going to kill him, but at home run derby's taxing, man. 
It is, and it's not even necessarily the actual physical side of it necessarily, right? It's just the, all the mental aspects of this season for Ellie. He's the face of the franchise. He's the cover boy for the, uh, I think it was Upper Decker Tops, the new uh, baseball card release thing. He was the poster boy for all that. So he's doing extra photo shoots, doing extra marketing stuff. Now you're going to go do the home run derby and the all-star game potentially. Back, I mean, there's just no time for him to sit down, decompress, and relax a little bit. And again, do guys go through this all the time and do fine with it? Yes. Are there articles out there like you were talking about that have looked up the evidence of guys participating in the home run derby and whether or not they struggle in the second half of the season after that? And it points to, on average, not necessarily. But there are definitely cases where that has happened to guys. and maybe I think it, it happened to Todd Frazier. I think it clearly happened to Todd Frazier. Right, and maybe it wasn't necessarily the home run derby. Maybe there were other reasons. Maybe they're always going to fall off. But why take that chance? Why right. mess with a guy, especially when he's this young and he's still finding his way and he does have all this extra pressure on him? If he was, look, if he was participating in the home run derby, I'd be thrilled to watch it. I'd be looking forward to it. He's an exciting player. He's got a ton of power and a skinny frame. It's fun to watch him do the things that he does. So I wouldn't be like throwing a fit if he were participating in the Hummer and Derby. I don't think it's a huge deal. Yeah. But overall, I like this decision. I think it's the smart one. Yeah. Part. Yeah, the home run derby to me has gone the way of the slam dunk contest. It's just it, it's it a does little nothing bit, for right? me. Isn't that crazy though? Because it felt like the home run derby was always just such a solid event. It was fun to watch. It was easy. I, I, Rick, I'll be honest with you. I, 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 you know, I've covered a lot of sporting events in my lifetime. And, and as much as I'm crapping on the home run derby at the moment, covering that home run derby when it was in town in 2015 for the all-star game was fabulous. I mean, it was, it was an electric event. It really was, but it just, again, why back has it the, lost the luster? Back, back, I don't, cause I don't know. I guess because it just, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I, I really are, don't. Maybe, are, maybe we really just have too many entertaining things going on to where our attention spans are so short. Maybe. That's like, it's just not enough anymore. It's just but not it's the cool same enough. thing. Like this, this dude, when the slam dunk contest was first held in the ABA back in 1976, it was cool to see Dr. J dunk from the foul line to see, you know, David Thompson do a 360. It feels like, no, we've seen every dunk known to mankind. And maybe but, that's what see, it that's is. The, I've seen every home run. Well, see, I think that's the, the, that's where they differ, though. Like, the home run derby is still, it's just like, you could be the one that hits X amount of home runs in your tournament. Like, you can still set a record with how many home runs you hit, or you can still hit the farthest home run that we've ever seen. There's still, like, bragging rights there. With the dunk contest, I do think, to some extent, it got so maxed out in terms of what you can do physically. Like, there aren't many more dunks you can do just based off human capabilities that we haven't seen already. And then what happened was guys didn't want to get embarrassed. They didn't so, want to go there and be embarrassed. So now it's no longer the top athletes doing it or the top dunkers doing it. It's like random dudes that no one cares about. And that's part of why it's lost so much. I'm not even sure I can tell you. Did, did that Mac McClung, was that this year that he won the slam dunk or last he, year? He, he's won it twice now. Oh, okay. All right. I remember. Yeah. I, okay. He won I this year. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. I, I, yeah. I paid no attention to it. And he wasn't in the NBA. He was in the G. No. Yeah, that's why I didn't think he played on a team. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. He, I think he was two years ago. He won it when he was on a team as a rookie, and then this year he won it as a G leaguer. And they have guys that I think like aren't even in the G leaguer, the NBA participating in the dunk contest now. Sometimes. So, uh, all right. One other uh, topic here on the Reds before we move on. Skinny Ken Griffey Jr. received his final payment from the Cincinnati Reds on Monday. The team had been making annual payments of three point five million for the last sixteen years of Junior after he deferred $57.5 million of his contract nearly two decades ago. So, Skinny, now that he's all paid up, looking back on Ken Griffey Jr.'s time with the Reds, do you think it was worth it? Um, I think it was. It's just a shame how it all played out. Um, again, you know, I had my run-in with him when I suggested that he be moved to a corner outfield spot, and he didn't like that suggestion and made it actually a national story, and I, I'll stand by it to this day because at that point of his career, he probably should have been and – uh, it was probably better served being a corner outfielder than a center fielder. Um, the injuries took their toll, but he did have milestone moments in Cincinnati. He had some special moments. The health is what we'll remember. Um, and, and honestly, that contract was just brilliant. I mean, the, the way they structured that deal, it was put into an annuity. I was told that actually, while it's reported as $3.6 million, because that's what was been paid, I guess, into the annuity each time, he, he gets about $5 million thanks, thanks to some of that. So what a brilliant, brilliant contract. That was for 16 years he got that kind of money for doing nothing. Just think about that. What a setup for life. You know, people talk about no doubt. 
weight gain and stuff. It's like, man, if I was getting $5 million a year, basically to do nothing, I think I would be living large too. I don't think yeah. I'd be in very good shape. No, I mean, his and Bobby Bonilla's deal are two of the two of the smartest ones. In fact, Shohei's got a similar deal going with even more money attached to it and deferrals. It is. It's brilliant. I mean, he's 54 years old getting getting really. I mean, he's won the lottery for 16 straight years um, while, while not even having to play a ticket. And he had already cashed a hundred million in his career right. before that, right? It's not like he didn't right. have the money up front on top of Correct. it. So, Correect. A truly a, a brilliant contract. But looking back, so, so, we, so we, Reds, yeah, we, we we put that story up each time, and it always does really well because it is fascinating to look and go, wait a minute, he's the third highest paid Reddy. Technically, isn't, but it's fun to put it in that context. Well, that that's the part of it that makes it even crazier. Is the Reds have had such a low payroll the last few years that he ends up being one of the highest paid players on the team every year too. Yep, for in sure. Theory. But but back to your initial question, I, I think it was worth it. I, I do. I mean, I wish it had wound up better. Um, I don't think that's all him. And honestly, again, playing all those years on concrete in the in the in, in the kingdom didn't help set him up for here. It probably set him up to fail. It was it, it really took a toll on his body? Yeah, it's it's so unfortunate. And I guess when I look at it, I'd much rather have Ken Griffey Jr. play on the Reds for all those years, and it really defined. A, a lost era of Reds baseball. I mean, if you're a fan in those years, which like were basically my end of my middle school into my high school years there that Griffey was here for, th that's all I remember really is Griffey being on the team, him and Barry Larkin kind of at the end there, th their locker room stuff that was going on. Like those are the memories I have of those years of Reds baseball. There's not a lot else to, to really look to there. They never made the playoffs. With right. Ken Griffey Jr. Well, and, that part and, of it and, sucks. I mean, and, and honestly, I blame Jim Bowden for some of that. He thought that was the be all end all making the Ken Griffey Jr. trade. And then he had so many poor drafts around it and so many other bad decisions that they, they really didn't build a ball club. I bring this up every time I think we talk about Ken Griffey Jr., but I can just never get out of my head. I remember so vividly at that time that Pokey Reese was untradeable, untouchable. That was holding up the Ken Griffey Jr. deal. They ended up having to give a lot of other things away, Mike Cameron, all these other guys, because they wouldn't trade Pokey Reese for Ken Griffey yeah. Jr. Yeah, well. That's crazy to think about. Hall of Famer, po oh no, wait a minute. He didn't make the Hall of Famer, my bad. How, I mean, did he, how much longer did he last in the major uh, leagues? Like uh, six uh, years? Enough. Years? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say enough. Yeah, I mean, but he was horrible. He never hit over like 220 the rest of his career, I don't think. I don't believe he did. <laughs> Anything else to get to on Griffey, the Reds, Skinny? Uh, no, I think you covered the gamut.